You're listening to Paleo Runner Podcast, a podcast devoted to finding better ways to live, run, train, and eat. I'm your host, Aaron Olson. You can find more information by going to paleorunner.org. you also find me on Facebook and Twitter. You can go to facebook.com slash runpaleo. My Twitter handle is at runpaleo. If you enjoy the show, please go to iTunes and leave a review. This helps increase the visibility of the show. Search for Paleo Runner in iTunes. Click on Ratings and Reviews. You can email feedback to Aaron at paleorunner.org. If you downloaded the show through iTunes and are listening on an Apple device, you can follow along with links and chapters. My guest today is Dr. Tatiana Obuhanich. Tatiana earned her PhD in immunology from Rockefeller University and has done research at Harvard Medical School and Stanford University School of Medicine. She is co-author of several peer-reviewed scientific publications and the author of Vaccine Illusion, How Vaccination Compromises Our Natural Immunity and What We Can Do to Regain Our Health. Hi, Tatiana. How are you? I'm good. My wife is in pharmacy school, and she came home one day, and she was telling me all about the vaccines that kids are having to take, and one of them was hepatitis B. And I was thinking, how is a child that's just born going to get hepatitis B? And so I started doing some research and Googling and searching on Amazon to find out more about vaccines. And I came across your book, and I'm just always really interested in things and how things work. And so uh, I came across it, and I wanted to contact you to find out more. So did you just stop on hepatitis B or have you read more? That's kind of where I stopped. Because once I found your book, I thought, okay, well, this is a an immune, immunologist perspective. Maybe it would be best to, you know, there's no way that I'm going to find out everything there is to know. It's much better to talk with the experts themselves. About a year ago, I started on this thing called the paleo diet, which is supposedly how our ancestors ate. And um, it's similar to like a Western price diet. And so as I, as I learn more about different ways of eating, it kind of opens my mind up to other ideas that, that might be important as well. Interesting that I was also attracted to Western price diet. Okay. And um, what I realized uh, that a lot of what they say that it's good for your teeth and for your bones and for fertility mm-hmm. is actually also good for immune system, although they do not discuss it that way. But once I start looking at uh, research literature from that perspective, uh, all of a sudden all these papers pop out into my attention, like what is vitamin A doing for the immune system or vitamin D? And all of these vitamins are really high on Western price food recommendations, right, list. Mm-hmm. But um, it's pretty much there is no not much awareness that these vitamins are important for the immune system. So (laughs) it's interesting. One thing is that one doesn't need to understand or know anything about immunology to be healthy. If you follow one of these diets, you know, Western Price or some extensions of it, you pretty much, you know, if you follow it really well and uh, conscientiously, uh, you guarantee (laughs) that your immune system will work. Mm -hmm. If you want a little bit more reassurance, you can you know, poke a little bit for more scientific information, what is not what is known by now. But it's really, you know, just for curiosity. You have a PhD in immuno- immunology, correct? Yes. And how did you become interested in immunology in the first place? Well, it was pretty much a random choice of doing a few rotations in graduate schools and then whatever lab that seemed like a good match for me, I ended up there. So in the beginning, there was not much of, you know, of a story why I got attracted to it. And But you have to realize that what immunology studies is really the process of immunization, um, which has nothing to do with how you naturally defend yourself from uh, you know, coming down with disease complications, right? Mm -hmm. So it's all for the sake of studying immune responses and for applying that information to make more vaccines. It's sort of its own circle. Mm -hmm. And um, while I was in the field, I knew nothing about what to do to build up resistance from diseases. Like if you get the disease, it will be mild rather than, uh, you know, completely deleterious. So this is something that I had to learn by myself. 
pretty much on my own free time. And uh, this is the information that is valuable to me as a parent and as a living being, right? Mm -hmm. Everything that I learned in school and whatever research that I had to do as part of my uh, PhD thesis or postdoctoral studies, all of that goes to feed the establishment and their goals. And it's really nothing there for us, you know, common people mm -hmm. to understand or um, and nothing valuable, really. OK. Mm. So at, at what point did, did you start researching on your own and and deciding whether, vac you know, vaccines were good or not? Well, of course, like everyone who is expecting a baby is interested to look into that. Mm -hmm. So that was the time for me to start looking at it critically okay. rather than just believing what the textbook says. And the textbook doesn't really give much of the references or background. It just has these uh, slogans that we remember and that, you know, we repeated to other people that smallpox is eradicated due to vaccines. Well, that's maybe correct. That's fine. But what does it have to do with creating new vaccines for all these mild diseases, right? Mm -hmm. So basically, yeah, I started on my own when it was my personal necessity. And um, that I really had to put aside, you know, professional pride or whatever mm -hmm. and see what's really the best for my child. Right. right. And um, since like one advantage that I have over other people who are, you know, scientists in immunology here is that I'm originally from Ukraine. Uh, Eastern European country. Mm -hmm. And um, actually, there are two things there. First of all, the diet over there was very common to Western price recommendations. Okay. So we didn't know that, but you we were just following it because it was a traditional kind of type of diet. And the second thing is that at the time of my childhood, we had plenty of childhood diseases. So I was exposed to pretty much every childhood disease. And um, none of it left me with complications or anything horrible that um, they like to scare people here, right? So because I had that kind of background just from the personal experience, I could make those decisions without that much fear as they're trying to put on us mm -hmm. and just really concentrate on what vaccines do and whether we can rely on vaccine protection. And one thing is that what people don't realize is they think that if you take the vaccine, it will guarantee that you will not get the disease. So they just weigh the risks of vaccine injuries or whatever they perceive that to be versus the risk of diseases, right? Mm -hmm. And they think that they would take care of the risk of diseases just if they vaccinate. But the thing is that it's much more complicated than that, that vaccines do not necessarily ensure that a person would not get the disease. For example, for myself, I got a um, vaccine for measles, actually two of them, and I got measles anyway. Mm. And this is also a reality for, um, uh, there are many reports in the literature on that. And uh, right now it's kind of, you know, it becomes evident that um, there is a genetic sort of variation in the human population. And in some some people, vaccine works more effectively than in others. And um, so it's not really a, a weakness of the immune system. It's just how the immune system responds to the vaccine per se. It doesn't mean that it would have any problem responding to the to go through the disease if you have to. But then, so basically, if you get vaccination, you still have to worry about diseases and what to do to make the disease, you know, mild. Uh, but then if you don't take vaccination, then you worry about it, but you don't have to worry about potential vaccine injuries. So you have like one last thing to worry about. You can just focus all your attention about to learn what kind of nutrition you need to keep your immunity strong along those lines, other than being overwhelmed with all the literature on potential vaccine side effects and short term or long term problems. So are you saying that if we keep our immune systems healthy, that uh, we can overcome some of these diseases if we're exposed to them? Like take something like polio. Is, is that something that our immune system can fight against? Yes. Yeah, so there is um, actually interesting observation in the past that when this, when the polio virus was still around, now it's eradicated, but when it was still around, uh, out of 1,000 people that they detected polio virus in their throats or in their stool, only 0.1% had paralysis. So 99.9% .9 had contact with the virus and uh, 
didn't have any disease whatsoever and 0.1% got paralysis. So what is the difference between 99.9 and 0.1%, right? If we kind of concentrated on that and determined what made them so weak that they succumb to the virus, as opposed to just blaming the virus and say, let's eradicate it Mm -hmm. the way we did, you know, that would be another way around. But, um, you know, public health decided to go the way that they always uh, do it. They just eradicate the, what we perceive as the enemy. And the problem with that is that specifically for polio, um, there is a disease that, that is called acute flaccid paralysis, which is indistinguishable from polio, except that it happens in the absence of the polio virus. Mm. So obviously there are other causes of this, this type of paralysis. Okay. And right now, once they eradicated the polio virus, it's not the cause of the paralysis anymore, but this paralysis persists in India and it's actually going up. Um, so in a way, we dealt with the virus we eradicated the virus, but we did not eradicate the disease globally, especially in those countries that, uh, you know, where disease persisted. Okay, interesting. What is the difference between natural immunity and immunity acquired by a vaccine? Okay, so um, net, uh, let's say naturally acquired immunity is when you do not experience the disease second time after you got the infection first time. And um, this is a very mysterious kind of phenomenon. And I mean, this was known for millennia, right, that people just get those major diseases once. If they survive, they never have it again during further outbreaks. And, you know, it is this common idea that we captured the basis of this immunity and that all you need to have is to have antibodies or something of that sort. And if you have antibodies to the virus, then that would guarantee that you that will guarantee the immunity. And that's why the whole thing about vaccines is how well they raise antibodies. And that's how the vaccines are judged most of the time. But the thing is that there are some observations in the past that are long forgotten. There are people who have this genetic disease that they cannot make antibodies at all. And yet they still produce immunity. Let's say if they get measles, they go through it just fine and they um, never get measles again. That, that Those were the observations in the past. And But still, you know, somehow the field still believes that it's antibodies and they, uh, you know, they just go after the antibodies, although antibodies could be just a correlation of immunity, not the cause, cause of immunity. So therefore, with vaccines, what we have is that immunity veins, it kind of stays there for a short time. Um, and then like it was shown in for mice, if you inject mice with live virus, the protective serum titers uh, that remain after that infection, they go on for a long time. But with live attenuated viruses of inactivated viruses, that protection just doesn't stay. So it's something about the live being, I don't know, the energy of the virus, uh, you know, some alternative circles will say life force or whatever of the virus that makes a difference. Mm. You put in exactly the same virus that is dead and it just doesn't induce that last, uh, you know, last uh, lasting immunity. And we have no idea why. So. Okay. Okay. So there's, there's still a lot to be researched, it sounds like, but because they're so focused on just creating vaccines, um, they don't, they don't allow the research to go in a different direction. Yes, uh, they do not. And I think they kind of reached a point um, that we believe in the molecular mechanisms and that's it. And we never go beyond to the next level. It's like we are being stuck on the Newtonian mechanics mm. and we don't allow for the possibility of quantum theory to be true, you know, to have another leap. And so basically this is where we are stuck in immunology right now and in biology in general. Um, and, you know, there is this uh, another kind of part of medicine, uh, homeopathy alternative, mm-hmm. alternative field that talks about energy rather than molecular mechanisms. Mm-hmm. And um, there are, a f- you know, the, in the history of immunology, there were a few research who kind of started researching something along the lines of homeopathy. And they were all kind of beheaded for their attempts to do that, even though they were established scientists. So immunology and homeopathy, they're just like enemies of each other, just like, you know, the modern medicine just would not allow homeopathy to to be acknowledged. And yet there is something interesting about homeopathy. And I had personal experience just with treating fever in my child with homeopathy, how well it works when it is done correctly 
basically it's it's just magic and we still do not understand why mm -hmm. you know i was talking to you at the beginning about how the paleo diet kind of opened my eyes to other ways of thinking about things like health and nutrition and I think that idea that the body is a complex system and we might not fully understand it is kind of difficult for some people to accept that there there may be things, you know, who knows what they're going to find 100 years in the future from now about what kind of foods are healthiest for us. So the, the paleo diet way of eating is to look at the body as a complex system that's not fully understood and, and say, how did we evolve to eat? And it sounds like what you're saying about um, immunology is that there's a lot of things that are still not quite understood. And just to, just to give uh, a panacea, one recommendation for everyone might not be quite correct. Yes. And interestingly, you know, just based on evolution, if you apply the same kind of evolutionary argument, what is best for our immune system? Vaccines were not there for millions of years, right, for us to adopt to vaccines. Mm -hmm. It's just like 200 years ago, there was one vaccine, and in the last 50 years, we got the rest of them. So why would our body even be able to handle vaccines? Because it's a very unnatural way of delivering um, antigens into your body, right? Mm -hmm. Right. So in a way, if you think evolutionarily, Mother Nature actually created the perfect vaccine. And really, when you really need the protection of something that we would consider a vaccine is really in, in the infancy. And the natural vaccine is actually breast milk. So everything that you, the baby needs for protection from viruses and bacteria in the environment at the time when baby's own immune system is not yet mature enough to deal with that all comes from the mom's immune system. And mainly, I mean, there are two ways. One is it goes through placenta in the beginning. And later on, you know, when the baby is separated, is born, then it goes through breast milk. And that's all that the baby needs. But we are, you know, uh, meddling with that. We take breast milk out, put formula in, and then vaccinate. And we think that we will get away with that kind of regimen. But I think the health of babies overall kind of show. So what do you say to people who say, you know, your theory might be correct, but in the meantime, we need, you know, vaccines have done a lot of good and, and we might need to consider them as a, our only option. I don't see... Uh, that this, especially the second part is correct. Why would vaccines be the only option mm. uh, when there is definitely the option of making your immune system strong by means of nutrition and, of course, breast milk in the beginning that to such a degree that you can withstand all these uh, viral diseases without complications um, and just have them as mild diseases or sometimes as symptomatic diseases, right? Mm -hmm. um, in the case of bacterial diseases, it's another kind of area that only happens when people are somewhat immunocompromised. It shouldn't happen at all in a health person. You were talking about how sure. how it's not the only it's not really the only option, and that if we we can strengthen our immune system to deal with these diseases and then overcome them and get stronger. Can you elaborate a little bit on that because the audio was getting a little bit choppy? Okay, so we can take an example of measles and. That would be kind of an easy example, right? Mm -hmm. So um, if you do the vaccine, that ensures that some people who are genetically predisposed to respond with high antibody production to measles vaccine, the way it is formulated, will be protected for long, longer time from you know, from uh, re from experiencing measles if they come in contact with it. Mm -hmm. But a lot of people will not. And that's just because of genetic variability. So later on, let's say 10 years after they got vaccine, or even sometimes five, depends uh, on a particular person, their levels of antibodies that are generated by vaccine gets so low that even if, uh, you know, if they get exposed to the virus, they get the disease. Okay. So, uh, in a way, v vaccination does not ensure that you will be free from the disease anyway um, for all the people. Um, so, what about the natural way to go around this? Um, so, if we were to allow the disease to happen but ensure that the disease will not be deadly or will mm -hmm. not lead to secondary complications like pneumonia, you need uh, your immune system to be really strong. And what does it mean? Um, it's really the nutrition. So there are um, a lot of vitamins that play a role in the immune system. And the one that I mentioned, uh, vitamin A, 
um, there are experiments already that show that without vitamin A, a crucial component of the immune system, which we call interferon, doesn't really work so well. So you need vitamin A in order for interferon to work. And what interferon does, it interferes, just like its name suggests, with uh, virus, viral infectivity. So let's say you got your virus in the cells and a few of the cells are replicating mm -hmm. the virus. Uh, once interferon is produced, that prevents the spread of the virus to other cells. So not so many cells are infected in your body. Um, so um, this way, you know, the disease doesn't become overwhelming and you can have a mild disease without complications and um, then allow this mysterious, you know, immunity get established and then you never need to have it again. So those are two ways and it depends on whether we want to give the responsibility for disease control into the hands of public health officials so that they vaccinate us and reduce our chances of exposure to the virus over time, although it takes very long time, like 40 years or so. Uh, to achieve that goal, or if we want to, uh, you know, take responsibility into our own hands and ensure good nutrition for ourselves, then that's what we do. And it's a personal preference. Uh, you know, I cannot convince other people to be on good nutrition if they don't want that. Mm -hmm. um, right. So uh, it's really a choice that people have to make. So what are some things that people can do to increase their immunity through nutrition? Well, pretty much if they have Western price like diets, then as I said, that ensures that they have uh, really high immune defenses. And that already showed even in the research of Weston Price himself, where he was mainly looking at tuberculosis. Mm -hmm. That was one of the, you know, of the plagues at that time. And so his nutrition correlated really well with the resistance to TB. Um, and that probably was due to vitamin D uh, effects and, you know, maybe even vitamin A as well. But um, basically what, what we have in Western Price diet is sufficient to keep your immune defenses strong. Can you talk a little bit about what the Western Price diet is? What, what makes it up? Um, Weston Price, so he did research in the 20th century, in the earliest 20th century, in various parts of the world. And he looked at the health and also um, dental status of various primitive people on their native diets versus uh, the same people, the, the same genetically uh, sort of similar people who were exposed to the Western diet and who adopted Western uh, way of eating, which would include white flour, sugar, and uh, sort of probably less of their natural foods. And he documented, you know, um, consistently and um, very painstakingly the differences in health among those kind of paired populations, genetically similar, but on different diets. And by doing this kind of research around the world, he came up with the rules or he, he came up with the trends of the diet to see what really in the diet makes people strong and robust versus weak and sickly. Um, and uh, what came out out of his observations is that um, you really need a diet which is rich in fat-soluble vitamins. And of course, there is a whole bunch of other recommendations down the list, but I think vitamin A and D are on the top. And of course, at that time, nothing was known about the mechanisms of these vitamins in the immune system. So it was just empirical research. And yet modern science confirms that these vitamins are extremely important in the immune system. Okay. Well, you know, as I'm thinking about this, what are the, what are some of the downsides that, that could result from getting a vaccine? I mean, some people might think, wouldn't it be safer just to get the vaccine and, and have a nutritious diet? Uh, this is a controversial topic because all we hear is that parents complain how their kids' health goes down after each round of vaccination to the extent that even if in the beginning they might have this kind of mindset, after they see how their health of their kids deteriorate, they just have to stop that. 
um, and I heard a lot of these kind of stories. So immunology really doesn't study how vaccines affect other systems in the body, especially the brain, because expertise of immunology is restricted to measuring antibodies and, you know, other immune responses, not how it overall affects health. So it's really what we have are parental observations, um, the databases of vaccine injuries, and this kind of information. And uh, now there are these studies that are starting to pop out that compare the health of vaccinated children with the health of unvaccinated children. And there is an obvious trend that uh, the health of unvaccinated children, especially those who make this choice consciously, rather than just by uh, by forgetting or by neglect, uh, that the health is really much better really? in unvaccinated children. Yes. Those studies can, of course, say uh, be criticized for saying, well, uh, we don't know if it's really the lack of vaccines that made the children healthier or other factors that health conscious parents, um, you know, choose to do, maybe extended breastfeeding or better nutrition as well. So, of course, there is like scientifically, there is uh, still some issues to work out. But the trend so far is is that way that with uh, in, especially in the developed countries mm-hmm. um, like, like United States, unvaccinated children on average are healthier than vaccinated ones. What what kind of health parameters do they measure in those studies? They measure chronic diseases, also allergies, asthma, uh, autoimmune diseases. Uh, things that are chronic in nature and that, um, you know, not something that you would just get over once and for all and you're done, but something that affects your life in the long term. Mm-hmm. I I get uh, allergy shots once a month and I had to go through like a six month buildup period. And I, I had my allergies as I got older, got worse and worse and worse. And finally, about a year ago, I decided to get vaccines for it. Uh, or I, I'm not sure if they call it vaccines, but I think it's called immunotherapy or something like that. And am am I doing harm to my health by getting those shots? I'm not really sure what the shots, those um, anti-allergy shots are about. So I cannot really comment on that. Okay. Okay. So after everything you've learned, what do you have recommendations that you give for parents? I cannot really give recommendations because I'm not a medical doctor and this is a medical topic. Mm -hmm. So I can only tell them about science and what choices they have, and they really have to make the decision and what they are going to be committed to. Okay, okay. Wow, well, you know, it's been very, it's been really fascinating talking to you. Um, I feel like there's there's so much more to think about now. I, I don't have any kids yet, but I, I would like to sometime in the future, and learn, learning about it um, from different perspectives, I think, would be a really healthy thing to do. Um, yes, for me, it's uh, it's also quite inspiring that uh, people are open minded and um, they are interested to learn the information, which is might be different from what mainstream is telling mm-hmm. and interested to consider and um, research further and make their own mind rather than just blindly follow, you know, uh, the, the population. So, right. yes. <laughs> What has been your feedback like from the scientific community and from doctors, from parents? Has it been positive? From parents, it's very positive. From my colleagues and from scientific community, it's not so positive. And of course, that's because no one in immunology ever studies in, to such as, you know, to such scrutiny the mechanisms of natural defenses. Everyone is focused on um, vaccine strategies. So it's really to talk about other things it's out of the box and they would they don't want to see that happening so but among parents there is a lot of gratitude and um yeah i've been enjoying talking to parents Mm -hmm. where do you where would you direct people who want to learn more about this to go well the information is all over the place uh, but one really interesting side that I think the information that they put out is um, quite good is um, International Vaccination Council. Okay. Um, yes. So I think the information there is very um, much based on science and they have a lot of references always in their articles. So um, instead of just listening to what one expert says versus another and, you know, uh, if there are scientific references that one can go to, it's better that way. Okay. Okay. Wow. Wow. 
Well, um, yeah, it, it's been a fascinating conversation. I, I really like the idea that there's other information out there and that we can, you know, make make decisions for ourselves rather than just relying on experts. Yes, I think that's important for people to understand because um, uh, it's one thing is to follow an expert and another thing is to follow the Joneses, right? And if the Joneses decided to go holistic and not vaccinate and you just do that Mm -hmm. blindly, that's not a good idea either, right? Right. It's better to um, really approach the situation this way. Like first uh, think about what is it that you want as a parent, for example. And of course, every parent wants to have a healthy child. And so then the second question is how do you define health? And let's say someone would say health is when the child doesn't have any chronic conditions, any allergies, any food allergies, asthma, doesn't have ear infections. The health of the child is so robust that there's barely any susceptibility to cold or flu every year. So if you want that kind of child, you look at the families who have children like that with such a robust health. And then you ask them, what is it that they do? Um, and ask about everything, parental style, what kind of food they eat, how long the breastfeeding was going on. And from there, just from the reality itself, people can, uh, you know, uh, discover for themselves what it is, what it, what does it take to have a healthy child. But because what the experts are talking, they're talking really theory mm-hmm. and um, you know, if you ask any expert, they will say vaccines are safe and effective. And yet, you know, for me, the vaccines did not work. I still had the diseases for which I got the vaccines. And for others, vaccines don't show up to be as safe as, you know, the establishment wants us to believe. So um, you really look at the real life situation. And from there, the answers will be obvious. Yeah. Would you mind going back to nutrition a little bit and talking? I'd I'd like to hear more about what you eat on a daily basis for our listeners so that they might be able to find out uh, or make decisions about um, what kind of foods to eat. Because I know you mentioned fat-soluble vitamins are very important. Right. So I try to follow as much as I can the Western Price Diet. And in the very area where I live, uh, we have access to raw milk, which is also one of the important uh, component of the Western price diet. Now, what I think the importance of the raw milk, uh, in addition to what um, you know the Western price describes, is that it has a source of it's a source of cysteine, which is not denatured, because when milk is pasteurized, uh, cysteine gets denatured and Undenatured cysteine is extremely important. And so um, we have to have that in the diet for our immune system to work and for other, uh, you know, components of the body. Um, and if it's not raw milk, then it has to be something else. But raw milk is probably the most easy or palatable food that we can think of. Uh, another thing that I do, which I do not necessarily recommend to everyone, but uh, I do it in my family, is that we eat raw eggs as well, as long as these eggs um, are coming from uh, from the sources that we know or we are more sure that they don't have any pathogenic bacteria. So that would be hands that are on pastures rather than uh, in the feedlot. Uh, and so, again, it's the same situation that raw eggs having antinatured cysteine. Um, we uh, eat fruits and vegetables. We try to eat as much raw vegetables and, of course, fruits as we can. Of course, we are not 100% uh, on that diet. Sometimes we go to restaurants and enjoy the food, which is not up to that standard. But as as far as we, when we eat at home, we try to use the high highest quality of food and again when we um when we eat meat or you know other animal products it has to be beyond organic it's not just organic but it has to be grass fed sources of meat um and milk um and basically everything that the western price recommends we try to implement that okay what would you say to someone who wants to get those um, those fat soluble vitamins that are in milk, but they maybe can't handle the the milk products because of say a, a case in allergy or a lactose intolerance. Okay, so there are products that are commercially available, which is undenatured whey protein, um, 
And however, a lot of this kind of stuff is not processed well and um, it's actually denatured. Or So you have to be uh, careful which brands that you use. Uh, we don't use that because we are okay with um, doing milk. But if someone cannot handle milk, they might consider uh, undenatured whey protein as another source of um, cysteine. And one of the recommendations that I heard from someone who used it and liked that it, it was Warrior Way um, brand. Okay, okay. What about grains? Is Are grains okay to eat on the Western Price Diet? On the Western Price Diet, grains are okay to eat as long as you ferment them. And so if you eat whole, I mean, it has to be whole grains, of course, but they have to be fermented to um, to sort of neutralize certain um, certain substances in the grain that make them less digestible. And so uh, that would be sourdough kind of bread or just uh, soak the grains or soak, soak porridges before you cook them the next morning. So, yes, yeah, so those are the recommendations of Western Price. Okay. So um, I've heard about soaking, but, you know, I, I don't really know what it is. Do you, you would take like a whole grain, like a grain berry or like oats, and you soak it overnight just in water, and then you can cook it the next morning? The thing is that oats, the way we eat them, they're already kind of uh, heat pressed and it's probably um, not worth soaking them because those enzymes that are supposed to do the job while they're being soaked to destroy those somewhat harmful, um, you know, substances, they're probably destroyed by heat. So soaking is really for the grains that haven't been tampered with yet by any heat. Okay. And I guess in our American diet, there isn't much uh, place for porridges the way it was in traditional diets. Here we have uh, these cereals in the box, which are also heat processed and extruded and pretty much dead nutritionally. So, but those those kind of cereals are really not recommended by Western Price. And if you were to eat grains, then sourdough breads would probably be uh, one way. Okay. Are are you um, so by eating the sourdough bread? Um, are you worried about the gluten that's in there? Uh, you can eat rye rye bread, which is um, doesn't have the same type of gluten as um, as wheat does. Uh, so I was never worried about gluten when I was in Ukraine because um, Ukraine really the wheat is the main grain and no one ever had any gluten intolerance, intolerance or problems. However, what they hear that in America the wheat is a little bit different. It has been selected um, in a such a way that gluten has some potentially, um, you know, more difficult to digest and maybe more easy to induce tolerance. So I don't really know. Uh, it probably depends. It, it might be true that um, the gluten in American wheat is different from how it was in traditional society. So one has to be careful. Mm -hmm. If your body doesn't agree with gluten, then don't push it. Okay. How about um, some organ meats like liver or kidneys? Um, do those have nutrients that would be helpful? Yes. Uh, and I eat liver a lot myself. It's not something that people like to eat, but again, because I'm from Ukraine and liver was um, a part of of the diet, so I'm kind of used to it. Mm -hmm. uh, liver has pretty much the whole pharmacy of vitamins and nutrients because all of that is stored in the liver. And again, you have to eat um, if you eat organ meats and liver from animals, mm -hmm. they have to be uh, grass fed okay. animals, not uh, but uh, not a feedlot because. Um, uh, in those animals, the liver obviously will be healthier, and there wouldn't be any toxins in there. Mm -hmm. And it's it's okay to cook it. That does that tamper with any of the nutrients when you cook it? And and how I, do you you know I, I've had liver, but it, I don't think it tastes that great. How do you prepare it so that it's palatable? Um, so I think vitamin A and vitamin D, the main ones in the liver, uh, are so heat stable, so it's okay to cook it. 
Mm-hmm. Um, so yes, I understand that the taste of liver could be very strong, and but I'm okay with it. I know other people might not be, and maybe there are ways to prepare it to mask the taste. But just to put salt and pepper and uh, pan fry it for mm-hmm. me, that 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 it does. It. Okay, okay. Well, Tatiana, thank you so much for talking with me today. It's 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 been eye opening, and it's been a very interesting conversation. Yeah, my pleasure. You've been listening to another episode of Paleo Runner Podcast. To find out more information, go to paleorunner.org. You can also find me on Facebook and Twitter. Go to facebook.com slash runpaleo or find me on Twitter with the handle at runpaleo. If you enjoyed this podcast, please go to iTunes and leave a review. Thanks for listening.